Last week I, I uh, shared um, a little bit. I shared, I shared about the uh, New Testament church in Acts. I want to, just in, um, just as a, a, a review, so to speak, of that, I just want to go back to that, and I think, I got to get to my, my thing here, I think is it the first, uh, there we go, the, sir, the, we talked about the church in Acts, and the first church, we remember we talked about the simple commitments in the New Testament church, teaching in the word, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayer, the communion of the uh, common, excuse me, the common good of one another, having a heart for the lost. Um, teaching the word, talking about the gospel. They were about the gospel, about what they had learned from uh, the life of Jesus and so on, and, and uh, how he was the Messiah that was uh, uh, prophesied in the Old Testament. We talked about fellowship and about getting, about people went, uh, they, they fellowshiped with one another. They were, uh, they were relational people. Uh, the breaking of bread, we talked about how the, the importance of that is, is they, they all had one thing in common, and that was the, the, the death and resurrection of Christ and the change that they had experienced through that. And then we had the common good of one another about how they no longer were tied to things, but they were tied to people, to relationships, and so on. And then finally, having a heart for the lost, we talk, uh, talked about having that, uh, that heart for the lost. One of the things I, uh, I just want to say, first of all, that um, the cultural, I mean, I want you to know, when we talk about the early church, it wasn't that the early church was perfect. Remember, this, the early church, the church in Acts is not the church, it was not the church in Genesis chapter 1 before the fall. It, there, there wasn't, this church wasn't perfect. But, but, they were, but they were pursuing the right things. They were pursuing the right things. And these were talking about they were pursuing these things. The cultural context and how they lived their lives was different. But the things that were per, they were pursuing in their lives was the most important. That's challenging from the standpoint of the things that we pursue in our lives. What are you pursuing in your life right now? Is, is, are you pursuing a life, a deeper life with Christ? Are you pursuing a, a, a deeper life with people? Are you pursuing a deeper life with understanding the word of God? Are you pursuing a deeper life, so on and so forth? Or what are you pursuing? Are you pursuing money? Are you pursuing things? Are you pursuing all of these other kind of things? What are you actually pursuing? Well, we finished up, you know, and, and, and deciding to follow Jesus means, doesn't mean just a lifestyle change. It means a complete life change, a complete life change. And we finished up with verse 47, and I want to go back to that. In verse 47, um, it said this, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, I loved, I found a, I found a, uh, a paraphrase of that that I just loved. And it's out of the uh, uh, contemporary English version. And it says this, while praising God, everyone liked them. And each day the Lord, ad Lord added to, the group, to their group others that were being saved. I like that. Everyone liked them. I mean, it's interesting to see that, isn't it? Everyone liked them. Well, I'll tell you what. You know what? Not everybody likes Christ's followers today. But it's said that everyone liked them. Are you liked? Are you liked by people that don't, aren't Christ's followers? I don't know. Are you liked? Just thought that was an interesting way to put it. You know, evangelism back then was not a game of tag. In other words, you go up and you say, tag, you're a believer. Because isn't that the kind of the way that we see this? That every, all of a sudden, every, all these people came and everybody, the, the, the church was added to on a daily basis. It was almost like a game of tag. You tag somebody and you say, that, hey, you're a believer now. It wasn't that way. It wasn't that way. 
Those that were added to the church. I'm going to get this thing fixed here one of these times. I'm getting, it's pulling there. There we go. But those that were added were those that longed for a different kind of life. They liked what they saw and they were ready to change. Those were, that were added were friends, neighbors, relatives, acquaintances, the people who were close enough to see the change in others and close enough to see what was happening to those around them. Now the question I have to start with this morning, are there people around you that you know that are part of your circle, so to speak, that aren't believers? Now that seems to be one of the problems to start with, and that is that people say, well, you know what, I really don't know any non-Christians. I really don't know any people that aren't Christ followers. Can I encourage us this morning that that's a problem right off the get-go? We are to be contaminators, if you will, and not containers as Art would put it. Art's got this message that he preached many years ago and talked about containers versus contaminators. In other words, the church is this container that's supposed to hold everybody here until Jesus comes back. But actually, there were supposed to be contaminators. But if we're never around people that need, that need Jesus, how do we contaminate? It's easy to look at this story of the first church and think, wow, you know what, all of a sudden, poof, all of these thousands were added to the church. Poof, there was another thousand added. Poof, no, that's not the way it was happening. There, was sub, uh, uh, there were people that, that experienced these people that, were, that had gotten saved. There were people that saw them and said, wow, what is going on with them? I've got to figure this out. I've got to have what they've got. Now, again, do you have people in your life that are close enough to see your life, to see a changed life, to see how you live life differently? Well, this wasn't guilt-driven evangelism. You better get yourself saved or you're going to go to hell. Now, even though... <laughs> how many... I'm, let me uh, take a little poll. How many grew up where that was kind of the the saying, so to speak, that that was the way of evangelism. If you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell because you have all these sins that need to be dealt with. Now, let me just say, is that a true statement? Yeah, that's a true statement. I don't think I see Jesus operating that way. I see Jesus operating in a, in a, in a, in a way of a of evangelism, of relationship, and building relationships. This wasn't a guilt-driven evangelism. This, the, these Christ followers uh, just joined what they saw Jesus doing in other people. They saw what Jesus was doing. They, they, they saw what happened through their, their, their testimonies and, and their life change and so on. It was a grace-based, spirit-led evangelism. Now, these people that saw this were what we would term people of peace. Now, that's kind of a funny term, except for those that have been through the life shapes and the huddles and things like that. You understand what I say when I talk about a people of peace. What's a person of peace? Well, let's turn your Bibles. I haven't got it up there on the screen. Make it look at your Bibles or your phones or whatever. But look, turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 with me for a second. And I'm going to try to get through this pretty quick here this morning. In Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 1. So my, my heading in my Bible says, the, the, the 70 sent out. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Now notice what they did to start with. He sent them out in teams. He sent them out in teams. And I think there's something about teams of people and, and, and you're going to see a pattern 
throughout this, uh, when I, when I, as I share this morning, about the God teaming people up in different ways. And he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. Okay, so first of all, he says, you got to know that the harvest, I mean, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of, the, the harvest is white. It's ready to go. We just need people to go out. And he goes on to say, go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet, greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. Now, one thing we pick up from that right off the get-go is not everyone is ready. Not everyone is ready. Not everyone is ready to receive the gospel and, and all of a sudden uh, uh, accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Not everyone's ready. Fair enough? Isn't that what it says? But whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if the son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. In other words, there's going to be some people that are going to receive your message. There's going to be other people that aren't. Simple as that. Goes on to say, and remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they gave, uh, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things that are set before you, and heal the sick there, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. Now notice what happens here. He says, when you go to the house, he says, don't just keep jumping houses. He says, if you, when you go to the house, if, if the peace is there, if they're ready to receive the gospel, then guess what? It's not only going to be for them, they're gonna, you're going to impact the whole community. You're going to impact the whole community. Heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. In other words, he's saying here, he's saying, you go to a house, you go to some place, and, and, and they're ready to receive your message. That's fantastic. And there's going to be great things that are going to happen. It's not only going to just be for them. There's, you're going to impact the whole community. I like that. I like that. But he says, also says that there's going to be some people that are ready for your message. But even so, by being there and sharing, you're gonna, the kingdom of God has come near. You see what that's saying? So in other words, even if you don't lead somebody to Christ, so to speak, or however you want to call it, 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 the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God, is, it's not a waste. Whatever you've got has been picked up. It's going gonna, it's gonna to sow some seeds. It's going to be, it's going to be, people are going to see that there's something different about you. They may throw you out, but you need to know that they're going to see something. It's not just going to affect, uh, it's not just going to be to no effect. Well, as we look at that, how do we recognize the peace, person of peace? Well, again, there's simply people who are ready to hear the message of the gospel. There are people that are ready to hear. Clearly not everyone is ready to hear this gospel message. We see that in the story of the rich young ruler. We have this rich young ruler that says to Jesus, what do I do? have to do to be saved? And, and Jesus says, uh, do this, do this. He says, I've done that. And he says, well, then give all your money to the poor and so on. And he walks, he, he, he's sad and he walks away. Did Jesus chase him? No, he didn't. He, as he was walking away, you don't see Jesus saying, but you need to remember that you've got a lot of sin, and if you don't get saved from that sin, then guess what? He didn't chase after him because he wasn't a person of peace. He wasn't ready for the message of the gospel. Now, I say this because not to discourage, your, 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 your discourage evangelism or, or touching people, but I'm just saying 
evangelism and understanding what happened there. It wasn't just all of a sudden hearing that message that says this and this. It was people, you don't just have a thousand people come become saved just by hearing one message. It comes from people walking with other people that see their lives change and they build relationship with and they come to a point of saying, I need to change as well. In 1 Corinthians, you, now you see this same thing, and it's the same ho- whole idea. Of, by the way, Mike Breen says this. Jesus' message to his disciples then and to us today is that, we, that as we are walking in this world, we are to be on the lookout for a person of peace. It's interesting because he says, as we are walking. By the way, did you know that uh, go ye therefore, the great commission... It actually means as you go. It's not this command to go. It's it's as you go. In other words, it's assumed that that's part of your life, that you're going to go. That you're going to go and and, and touch people. That you're going to go and relate to people. That you're going to go and and, and declare uh, the gospel through what you say in your life. As you go. So we're looking for people... For, look out for the person of peace. Now, in 1 Corinthians, we see this passage. My job was to plant the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it. But it was God, not we, who made it grow. The ones who do the planting and the watering, or watering aren't important, but God is important because he is the one who makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work as a team with the same purpose, yet they will be rewarded individually according to their own hard work. So here again, you see this dynamic of their stages and people's coming to change. Again, we, 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 we want to see people change, boom, just like that, but there are stages that, that happen. There are people, I mean, the Holy Spirit can do what he wants to. He can, you know, if he wants to bring somebody to Christ, like, boom, he can. But what you see happening is you see this walking with people into change. It's a whole different evangelism than what we're maybe most a lot of us are used to. Now, in the addiction, in the in the addiction world, we have uh, we use what's termed the stages of change model. It was de- developed in 1982 by some psychologists. Uh, their names aren't necessarily important for what we're sharing here this morning, but uh, I don't believe this is just about addiction. I believe it's just I, I believe it's natural in humans. I, I believe humans, it's, it's how human beings change for the most part. And if you think about your life and how you changed. Now, right from the outset, again, I want to clarify that the Holy Spirit can and does work however he wills. He can use hearts and minds to change in an instant, and it's not confined to any particular model. He is free to change you and me or someone you love when and however he chooses. It must also be stated up front that you and I are, are not responsible for someone else's change. We're responsible if you be faithful. But let me just briefly give you some of the stages of change and as it relates to how we as, as people change and how we see people changing. And again, why is this important? Well, this is important because we don't get discouraged when we're sharing, our, sharing Christ. We don't have to put a, quote, notch on our belt every time that we share Jesus. Because God is using different people, different people to touch people's lives. You may be the one that plants the seed. You may be, be one that just uh, waters, but you understand that God's going to bring the increase. So, this, so these stages of change, we look at this first one, pre-contemplated. Now what does that mean? Kind of a big word. What does pre-contemplated mean? Well, first of all, at this stage, people aren't even thinking of change yet. You ever... Talk to somebody who hasn't even thought about change yet, especially Christ change. Whatever sinful behavior they're engaged in, they are enjoying it enough that the cost of surrender and change seems too high. Now, I'm going to use the, I'm going to embarrass Derek here a little bit this morning. Can I embarrass you this morning? You what? You have no choice. Now you sound like one of my kids. 
We have had people that, you heard Derek's story, we have had people that come in and out of the God pod. There are some people that are pre-contemplative. They have, they, they, they have no desire to really change. They may talk a good talk, but they really don't have a desire to change. When Derek came into the God pod, he didn't know he was going to be in there. But God did. When Derek came into the God pod, probably the last thing he wanted is to be around a bunch of guys coming in and tell, talking about the Bible. Fair enough? Yeah? He was a basketball guy. He thought he could play basketball. I always thought I'd put that in there too. But you know what? He, he was... I, I don't even think, I, I think he was pre-contemplated. Even though he came, we, the background he came from, there was a, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a background rooted in Christ, he wasn't ready. He wasn't ready. Now keep that in mind. We see the rich young ruler wasn't ready to change. Moves us into stage two. I'm skipping some things here simply because, by the way, what do we do with people that aren't even ready to change? Well, I think we get a good verse here that says, For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? How do you smell? You turn to your neighbor and kind of sniff. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I don't have to. <laughs> but how do you smell? Are you an aroma for Christ to those that are, that are perishing? Some people are, are maybe not even an aroma for those that are not perishing. But, but are you an aroma for those that don't even have a, have a clue about changing for Christ? How do you smell? And don't say with your nose. How do you smell? You see, we want to be an aroma. How do we, what do we do? So as Derek comes into the pod, there was an aroma there. There was an aroma there. You see, when we come and we start touching people that don't know Christ, that don't even have an, don't even have an idea of change on their, on, their, on their chart, on their horizon, what, we're become, what we become, what Christ is asking us to become, is an aroma. Let your smell go everywhere. Pre-contemplative. I could have used Ryan too, but I chose you today. All right? Yeah. So, what about the second one? Contemplative. What does that mean? At this stage, people actually begin to think about change. That is, it's on their radar that change might be worth the work. They're not yet convinced that change is necessary, but they are willing to consider it. When someone is in this stage, we can help them weigh the pros and cons to move them toward fuller repentance. Turn with our, our, we got, I got it up here, I think. Acts chapter 17. Look at the example of this. Yep, that's right. Acts chapter 16, verse 20. It said, uh, 16 to 20. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, this, this, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to the idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. Do you see the differences up there? You have some people that say, what in the world? This guy's a babbler. This guy's nuts. And other people said, hey, I want to know a little more about this. I want to know a little bit more about this. Let's go on here a second. 22 to 23. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens. By the way, who knows what this, is, what this whole passage is titled? What is it's Paul's what? Where's he at? Okay, but where's he at? 
Mars Hill. This is the Mars Hill passage. So he says here, he goes on to say, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. And when they heard, I mean, I just want to back up and say, you know what? He was using the things right there in front of him to present the gospel. That's what he was doing. It wasn't that hard. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again. There you go. There's some stages of change right there. Some, say, some mocked him, and some says, hey, we want to hear more about this. Acts 17, 34, there were still others, it turned out, who were convinced then and there and stuck with Paul, among them Dionysus and Arap. I, I, yeah, it's, it's, you see it right there. And a woman named Demarius. Now, I like that. I put the message version of that in there from that, uh, that chapter, uh, verse 34. There were still others, it turned out, who were convinced then and there. So you have three different stages of change here. You have some that say, I don't really care. I don't really give a rip. You're just babbling on and on and on. I don't want to hear any more. Then the others come and say, hey, I want to hear some more about this. And then there were others that says, wow, boom, I'm gone. I'm there. Stages of change. Jesus said, and I, I think this is really important. You know, what do we do with people that are contemplating change, that are about ready to change? Well, first of all, the thing we don't do is we don't tell them it's all a bed of roses. If we tell them how good it is without telling them the challenges it is, now here we can say we all know that, that a, uh, being a, a Christ follower is a good thing and there's blessings of that and joy and so on. But the fact of the matter is, how many here have had struggles being a, a Christ follower? The rest of you now are in trouble because you're all liars. Yeah, it's, and, and, and the worst thing that we can do is, man, we want this person to come to Christ, so we're going to tell them all the good things, not the bad things. No, we need to tell them that there are going to be struggles. Jesus said, Matthew 16, 24, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Who wants, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Jesus was right up front with it, wasn't he? He says, You're going to be a disciple of mine? Guess what? You're going to have trouble. There's going to be some problems. Then finally we get to this stage where we saw a little bit ago where people were ready to change. And the final, that, 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 that fourth one is preparation and action. They were ready for action. At this stage, people are persuaded that change is necessary, but have yet to actually achieve it. And we are excited when people are at this point, aren't we? Yeah! Yeah! Some of you have prayed for loved ones that, that you prayed for and prayed for forever and ever and ever, it seems like. And then all of a sudden, they finally came to a point of saying, Wow! I need to change. And you are so excited. The length of the stage varies. Sometimes people want to implement change immediately. Other times people just need a little time to process. Our goal in this stage is to help them make a plan for what change will look like while not getting bogged down in and overwhelming them with the details. It's interesting because in Luke 19, now, now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich, and he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short stature. He was Ryan Wellman's problem. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Guess what? Zacchaeus was a place of change, wasn't he? He was ready to change. I'm going to climb a tree because I want to see who this Jesus is. There are going to be people in your life that are going to say, yes, I want to know who this Jesus is. Another example, is, and I'm not going to go into it, but it's Christ with the woman at the well. Same thing. Key component here is prayer. Pray for these people. 
Pray for the ones. How many of you know, how many of you have seen people that have come to Christ and the first six months they are just alive and fired and everything else and then all of a sudden something happens. And now it's not very exciting anymore. Finally, the last stage is the maintenance stage. Once a person has decided to follow Christ, they reach the maintenance stage. In this stage, the fo- by the way, I don't believe we're ever, quote, in maintenance stage. We're, we're growing. We've got to be growing all the time. In this stage, the focus is on continued spiritual growth. At this stage, people strive to move from one time act to a habit. This is the longest stage and the one with the most likelihood of relapse. Let me just close with this. And again, I went through this a little faster than I wanted to, but that's all right. Perhaps the most important thing to remember in discussing these stages is that the final outcome isn't in our hands. The point of this whole thing is that in the early church, again, we see this great explosion of people and and people coming to Christ. But the fact of the matter is, it didn't just happen supernaturally from the standpoint of God zapped it. There were people involved. They were, there were people that saw lives changing and wanted to be like, and wanted their lives to change as well. But there were also people that weren't ready to change. Not everyone that I'm sure they talked to or spent time with really was part of that first explosion. You have to understand that as we walk, as we go, as it says, that there are going to be people that we come to meet that are going to be at different places in their life. Don't give up on them. Don't say just because you're at this point, or don't think think just because they're not ready to change that you give up on them. I had a I had a vision one time, I don't know, a dream or whatever it is. We had been praying for a particular issue. And I saw a hammer with a hand gripping it and one by one I saw this other hand taking and pulling the fingers off of it till it was only being held like this and then all of a sudden that finger was gone and the hammer dropped and I felt like God said don't give up on people Stay holding on. Let faith arise. Stay holding on. I'm glad we stayed holding on with Derek. I really am. I'm glad there were people that continued to pray for him and still do pray for him. There were people that stayed holding on. You have loved ones or people that are important to you in your life that it's been almost frustrating because you see, you don't see change, you don't see them want Christ. Don't allow the grip to be taken away. People that God has placed in front of you and put in your lap, so to speak, that you want so badly to change and and sometimes you get these little glimpses that you think maybe they're going to. Well, yeah, they might be people of peace. They're ready to make a decision. Don't give up on them. Do whatever God wants you to do. See what God is doing and join it and encourage it. There are people there that you go to work each day and you say, man, this guy is so anti against me. What is going on here? This person is so anti the gospel, anti Jesus. I don't know what's going on. You know what? Don't give up. You've planted a seed. Allow someone else to water and allow the Lord to bring an increase. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we look at this, uh, this early church and, and we say, Lord, we understand that uh, this church wasn't perfect. 
but it had some things going, uh, some, some things that were prioritizing their lives that as individuals that are so key. Lord Jesus, I ask that, first of all, we too, we too would be about endeavoring after those things that are going to grow us spiritually. Father, I ask too that you help us get an understanding of what you're doing. Lord, instead of just, instead of just not understanding and not even seeking you for what's going on, Lord, may each day we wake up and we pray, Lord Jesus, will you show me the person of peace? Will you show me the person that I'm, you want me to plant seeds in? Will you show me the person that, that, that's, that's, that's getting, starting to get close, starting to ask questions so that I can water that? But Lord, may we pray that also that you bring the increase, that you're responsible, Lord God. Lord Jesus, you said that you would build your church, and we believe that and we trust it. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord's blessings to you.